You're listening to Bible Truth Feed, a podcast by Christadelphianvideo.org for Christadelphians and all those seeking the truth about the Bible message. Join us now as we present our latest episode. Standing here on the 18th of September 2022, uh, little could I have known when I submitted this subject um, to those here to choose it at, at, uh, at rugby, that death would be such a major con- element of the national consciousness right now. Of course, with the, with the death of, of Her Majesty the Queen, it, it's, everyone, it's in everyone's minds, isn't it? The, this issue of death and, and perhaps what happens, we've, we've seen and we will see again tomorrow, uh, religious ceremonies being held. Uh, we've had them in, in Scotland, Wales and Ireland this week. All referring to, to the Queen and, and, and particularly that she had a, a strong faith. And very often you'll hear something like, well, she's looking down on us or she's with Prince Philip now. And so we, some idea, therefore, that in that uh, those those thinkings that there is some element of, of the body or the life or the person uh, that lives on after death and has some form of consciousness, should we say? But for this talk, uh, will your soul go to heaven or hell? We need to really um, consider the subject uh, in fully in, in terms of what the Bible says, and we're going to have to break it down uh, that title into two parts. Uh, Firstly, we're going to see what the Bible says about this thing called the soul, which which we read, it it was in our chapter. What is it? What can happen to it? Uh, And secondly, we will look at that issue of, well, what the Bible says happens or can happen to the soul um, at death. Would it go to heaven or would it go to hell? So how does the Bible describe the soul? Well, in the original Hebrew and Greek texts that form the basis of, of our modern translations uh, of the Bible, um, that there's, there's one word in each of the Old and the New Testament uh, which is commonly translated soul, in the, uh, certainly in the King James Version uh, translation of the Bible. In Hebrew, we've got the uh, original language of the Old Testament. It's this word nephesh. And in the Greek... Uh, the original language of the New Testament, the text, uh, it is the word suke or psyche. And we get the word English word psyche from that, uh, and they are the ones that are mainly translated soul. And very often when we come across the words in scripture, we want to understand uh, what they mean, the first appearance of those words in the Bible can provide a very good basis of what the meaning then uh, is behind it that, that when it appears later on. So, for instance, if we look for that word nephesh in the Old Testament, in a Bible concordance, uh, which lists out all the occurrences of a word uh, in the Bible, we find that nephesh uh, it, it first appears in the very first chapter of the Bible. It appears on numerous, numerous occasions in Genesis chapter 1. That's an online uh, version of, of the um, Uh, of a concordance that I've got there, and we can see the word appears four times in Genesis chapter 1. So first, it appears at verse 20 of Genesis 1. It says there, God said, that the waters bring forth abundantly the moving creature that has life. And it is that word life uh, that is the same word that is translated elsewhere in the Old Testament uh, as soul. It appears again in the next verse, verse 21. It says, God created great whales and every living creature that moves. And this time it's the word creature uh, that is translated from that word nephesh. And again, verse 24, God said, let the earth bring forth the living creature after his kind. Exactly the same. And then once, once again, uh, the word life is used in verse 30 when it says, where in there is life. And each time we've got that word life is translated, it's a combination of two words that could be translated, therefore, as a living soul. And particularly notice here, in this context, 
It is simply talking about animals. It's talking about creatures uh, the, you know, the, of, of, our, of our, our, our um, fauna of the world. Not particularly anything to do with man, humankind, or anything like that. It's talking about animals in general. However, the word is used in relation to man in chapter 2. So again, if we go into chapter 2 of Genesis, we can see in verse 7, it talks of God breathing into Adam the breath of life, and then Adam becomes a living soul. So in actual fact, there is, there is a simplicity, really, about how this word is being used here. It's simply to indicate that these creatures and man himself became living beings, living bodies, rather than ones which aren't alive uh, when this breath of life is in them. And again, we re-emphasise here, there's no difference here um, in this description between human beings and the rest of the animal kingdom. So whatever this soul, living soul means, living creature means for, an, for a human being, this is the same for an animal. And, and that's what's very clear there in the old, in, when it's first used in the Old Testament. So when we come into the New Testament, we see a very similar parallel between the word soul and a living body. So again, the word which is elsewhere translated soul in the New Testament first appears in the New Testament in the story of Herod. If you remember Herod, uh, the king of, of Judea at the time when Jesus was born, attempts to kill the young child Jesus whilst he was in Bethlehem. And so it's in Matthew 2, verse 20, Joseph is told, that's uh, um, Mary's husband, is told to, is now safe for them and the fam and Jesus and the family to return back to Israel because it says they are dead which sought the child's life. And it's again that word, life, uh, they're his soul. And then looking over into chapter 6, verse 25, in Jesus' teachings on the, Mount of, um, on the Sermon on the Mount, he says there, Take no thought for your life, uh, what you shall eat or what you shall drink. So again, this same word, this word that's elsewhere translated soul, is linked with a physical side of life. And the next word, though, uh, where it's the next use of the word, the third one down there on the screen, uh, where it's used in the New Testament, is, is an interesting one. This is in Matthew chapter 10, verse 28. And it says there, Fear not them that are able to kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul. And that sort of adds a different dimension, doesn't it, to this, what we've been looking at. But rather fear him, which is able to draw, destroy both soul and body, in hell, or as the word is there, in Gehenna. And that Jesus is telling the people to fear God is, is self-evident. So it is God, or potentially his representatives, God is the only being that the Bible tells us that we should fear. Because he has the power of life or death for each and every one of us. So what is Jesus telling us about the soul here in Matthew chapter 10? Well, firstly, his, his place, his reference to that place where this destruction takes place was Gehenna, uh, or Gehinnom, the valley that was just at the south of the city of Jerusalem, uh, which in the past was, was used as a rubbish tip and be, because of the fires that, that burned there continually that, to clear the waste that was thrown in it. It was synonymous then with the idea of utter destruction and these fires that were continually burning. And so he's saying that God is the only one then who has the power to destroy not only our physical bodies, but also by condemning us to death for good, our very life itself. <clears throat> and the only way uh, that our life might not be destroyed for good upon our death the Bible tells us later on, elsewhere, it is through resurrection. That is the only way that life can be given back to a dead body. And that's actually hinted at later in this very same chapter, when again, the same word is once more translated life in verse 39. Because there it says in Matthew 10 verse 39, he that finds his life 
shall lose it. He that loses his life for my sake shall find it. Suggesting that if for some reason you actually lost your life, your physical life for Jesus' sake, or you gave up the important things perhaps that are important to you in this life, which is probably more relevant to that to what Jesus is saying, for Jesus' sake, he says, actually, you know, if you do that, you will be rewarded with life itself at another time. And that's made clear by the reading that we had at the start. So if you've got your Bibles open, please turn back to Acts chapter 2. Because here we've got the Apostle Peter being moved by God to give a commentary on some of the Psalms of David that were written down a thousand years, a thousand years earlier. And how those were a prophecy and related to the, the events that surrounded Jesus' death on the cross, his burial, and his subsequent resurrection. <clears throat> so, if we're in Acts chapter 2, and verse 22 to 24, firstly. It says there, You men of Israel, hear these words, Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved of God among you, by miracles and wonders and signs which God did by him in the midst of you, as you yourselves also know, him being delivered by the determinate counsel and for knowledge of God, you have taken and by wicked hands have crucified and slain, whom God has raised up, having loosed the pains of death because it was not possible that he should be holden of it. So Peter's explaining what had happened to Jesus. Only a few days before, about 40 days earlier, Jesus had been crucified he died, and he'd been raised up again by God, indicating because Jesus hadn't sinned, he wasn't able to be kept in that state of death. It wasn't right that he did, and so God raised him. He had to raise him, in that sense, uh, from the dead. And to show that these events had been foretold in the Old Testament, Peter expounds one of the Psalms of David, which in our Bibles, is recorded as Psalm 16. And so this quote runs from verse 25 through to verse 28. Because it says there, For David spoke concerning him. It says, I foresaw the Lord always before my face. He is on my right hand, that I should not be moved. Therefore did my heart rejoice, my tongue was glad. Moreover, also my flesh shall rest in hope. Because you will not leave my soul in hell. Neither will you suffer your Holy One to see corruption. You have made known to me the ways of life. And you shall make me full of joy with your countenance. And in verse 27 we have this word translated soul. In the psalm, in Hebrew, it's the word nefesh that we looked at earlier. And here in the New Testament it is this Greek word suke. So Peter is going on to explain then in verses 29 to 30 that David wasn't talking about himself. But instead he was prophesying about what would happen to Jesus. And he, and he further explains what verse 27 meant when he looked when in verse 31. He says there, he seeing this before spoke of the resurrection of Jesus that his soul was not left in hell, neither his flesh did see corruption. Now the psalm here uses a common Hebrew way of, of writing, whereby the same thing is said in two different ways uh, with in, in, verse, in phrases following each other. So when it says, you will not suffer your Holy One to see corruption which is explained by Peter as referring to Jesus' body or his flesh. That is a set, and so that is essentially an echo of the earlier phrase, you will not leave my soul in hell. So those two things go together. God saying, uh, this, this, the psalmist saying, you will not leave my soul in hell, talking of what, what happened to Jesus, you will not suffer your Holy One to see corruption. The two things are the same. He's saying, when it says you will not leave my soul in hell, you won't leave my flesh, my body, in uh, to see corruption. So Jesus' death is described as his soul going to hell. 
That was where his body would have corrupted. It would have rotted if he hadn't been raised on the third day. And so he was, he was laid in this tomb. He was laid in the tomb of Joseph of Arimathea. That was his hell. That was his grave. And so that has profound implications, doesn't it, for, for our understanding of what the soul is and what qualities it has. Jesus' soul, it says, went to hell. And if it had remained there, it would have seen corruption. His body would have seen corruption. His body was in the grave. So what it can't mean then is that this soul is some kind of esoteric element of our human existence which goes on living beyond our natural death. Or some immortal spark that has a, a destination of its own after death. What's clear that's being said there in, in these verses instead is that the soul is very closely bound up with our, our own mortal existence. And the only way it can continue in existence is through resurrection from the dead. See, the Bible describes many things about the soul. And the, and the ones I watch on the screen are just the ones that appear in the very first three books of the Bible, Genesis, Exodus, and Leviticus. It says there the soul can live. It says it can be cut off or separated. It can be saved. It can, be, it can bless. It can be preserved. It can cleave. It can long for. It can depart, which means it can die. It can be in anguish. It can be bound up. It can eat. It can be satisfied. It can be atoned for. It can, be, it can sin. It can touch. It can swear. It can commit trespass. It can be defiled. And elsewhere, it explicitly says, the soul that sins, it shall die. But nowhere in the whole of the Bible does it ever say the soul is something that's inherently immortal, that goes on living after death. In fact, quite the opposite. Now, I suppose a related idea to the idea of soul is that contained in the use of the word spirit in the Bible. And again, there's two main words, mainly translated spirit, in the Old and the New Testaments. In Hebrew, in the Old Testament, is the word ruach, and in the Greek, in the New Testament, is the word pneuma. Now, I can't spend uh, too much time on this, but simply to say, the basic meaning of, of both those words is either referring to breath or wind. Although it can, by extension, also be used to describe a thinking or a direction of our thoughts as well. And to illustrate that, we'll just use the account of the flood, uh, which describes all living beings that were going to be destroyed by that flood. In Genesis 6, verse 17, uh, we read this. Behold, I, even I, do bring a flood of waters upon the earth to destroy all flesh wherein is the breath of the Ruach of life from under heaven. And everything that is in the earth shall die. And again, at chapter 7, verse 15, it says there, and they went in, um, the animals went into Noah, uh, into the ark, two and two of all flesh, wherein is the breath of life. And so once again, there was no distinction made here between human beings and the rest of the animal kingdom that were going to be destroyed. All of them exist physically because they have this breath of life in them this breath and when it leaves the body when that breath leaves the body uh, uh, they can no longer take it in of course where, when they're underwater they would die and so to the second point with it, that we mentioned at the start well what can happen to the soul can it go to heaven or hell well, I think we've probably really answered that point already uh, in, in what we've already looked at. But let's just think of it in this context of that Acts passage that we've already looked at. See, the very last words of Jesus recorded in the, by, the gospel, uh, by, the Luke, by Luke in the Gospel, when Jesus died on the cross, he said, Into thy hands I commend my spirit. And yet we have Peter's testimony here, in Acts chapter 2, that Jesus' soul went to hell. So when Jesus breathed out his last, 
He was simply commending how he had lived and used that life, all that he had done uh, throughout his life. That living breath that he'd been given by God when he was born and accepting that actually all that I have done is in your hands, God, Heavenly Father. And it's in your hands to raise me to life again from the dead. It wasn't that some part of him suddenly flew away to be with God. When he says, I commend my spirit, it's thy hands I commend my spirit. It wasn't just flying away to be with God. Jesus knew he was going to die. It's clear he knew the Old Testament. He knew he was going to the grave. And that's where his soul would be. He knew Psalm 16 as we have it. And indeed, when we, we look further into Acts t chapter 2, it's clear Jesus only goes to heaven when he is raised up to sit at the right hand of God, which is actually recorded, the time of that is actually recorded for us in the events of Acts chapter 1. And so this is where we need to just understand this, this, the very simple teaching of the Bible about what exactly hell is. Now, that's a separate subject in itself, but this... Again, this passage in Acts helps us once more to realise it is simply the grave. Where all of us, everyone who dies, including Jesus, go. It's a place of unconsciousness. It's not a place of torment, ruled over by a supernatural being called the devil or anything like that. <coughs> I've already talked about Gehenna, that rubbish tip, uh, the south of, of Jerusalem, synonymous with, that utter, with utter destruction. And most of the ideas that, that are gleaned from the Bible or taken from the Bible uh, as it being a place of torment come from passages where it is that word that is used and is translated as hell. See, the other main word translated hell in the New Testament uh, and the one that's used here in, in, in Acts chapter 2 where it says his soul went to hell is the Greek word Hades, uh, and that's equivalent to an Old Testament word used in Psalm 16 called Sheol. So those are the, are the, are the main words that are used uh, for hell in the Bible. And that's how often those words appear in Bible texts and how they're translated uh, in the King James Version. And as you can see, in the Old Testament, it's basically a 50-50 split when that word a Sheol appears, as when the translators of the King James Version chose grave or hell to translate it. Um, they, they basically left it as, as Sheol um, in, in, in many um, modern translations. Because on so many occasions, when that word was used, it simply could not be that, that traditional view of what hell was, this place of torment. It, it clearly meant just the grave. And I say that's why uh, many tr modern translations, if you have those with you, will simply actually leave Sheol, or Hades even, in the text. They won't actually translate it now as hell, um, uh, or, or, or alternatively the grave. So, to simply answer that question uh, that we have of, of tonight, will my soul go to heaven or hell? Well, actually the Bible answer is very clear. Because all who die before Jesus' turn will go to the grave. So we will all go to hell. The, the, uh, each of our lives will end. Our soul will be in hell. Our bodies will see corruption, either through cremation perhaps or, or through uh, natural decomposition that will occur when the body is buried. And that's exactly what the Bible says happened to David. So back in Acts chapter 2, verse 29, it actually said, let me speak to you about the patriarch David. Yet he's both dead and buried. You can visit his sepulchre to this day. He's saying that's where David is, that's where David's body is. It's in this sepulchre, and you can visit it. And explicitly, verse 34, David is not ascended into the heavens. So David, this... Uh, beloved king of Israel, a man after God's own heart, hasn't ascended to heaven. And so the true and simple Christian hope that is put forward by the Bible is it isn't that some immortal part of us goes off to heaven to be with Christ and with God when we die, but that they will be given immortality and live again in God's kingdom 
after resurrection from the dead and judgment. And that's going to occur when Jesus comes back from heaven. So he's, he ascended to the right hand of God. He's sitting, he's waiting there at the right hand of God's throne. He's active now as a high priest for believers. But it says, it continues, verse 34, where it's just said about David not being ascended to heaven, but it says to him, to Jesus, the Lord said to my Lord, so that's the Lord God, said to my Lord, that is Jesus, sit here on my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. And so God will send Jesus back to this earth. He will send him back to set up his kingdom once more upon it. And so we pray that all listening to this will accept that basic truth, simple truth, of the gospel message that's given to us in the Bible. That that is the hope, that is the true Christian hope, and that we'll all be there in that day. Thank you. Thank you for joining us. We hope you found the episode helpful. Don't forget, most of these episodes are also available as videos on our video channel, cdvideo.org. So head over and take a look. If you have any comments or questions or suggestions, please get in touch or leave us a voice message. We love to hear your feedback. You can email us at bt f at cdvideo.org if you enjoyed the episode then please share it with others until next time may god bless you in your studies and your walk towards god's kingdom amen